of the continent. And we do have, have the um, good fortune and the honor to have the first Secretary General of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area um, Arrangement here with us today to deliver this public lecture. Um, but before we um, hear from him, I'd like to introduce for his opening remarks, Dr. George T. French Jr., who is the um, president of Clark Atlanta University. He um, has an illustrious, he's had an illustrious career. Um, prior to joining Clark Atlanta University, he served as 14 years as president of Miles College, making him one of the longest serving university presidents in the nation. Um, thank you so much for joining us, President French. Um, the floor is yours for your opening remarks. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilpin. And again, to Secretary General, uh, to Assistant Secretary General, our, our Vice, um, and, and to um, all colleagues on uh, this distinguished panel and on, on, on this call. It's an honor to be here to represent Clark Atlanta University. And indeed, it's been my honor to serve now as probably about uh, Secretary General, the third uh, longest serving president, HBCU president in the nation. It's been my distinct honor because we serve not only uh, the United States, but my passion and our passion is for the diaspora and our passion is for the continent. We were recently, uh, my wife and I were recently at the African Union in Addis Ababa, uh, Ethiopia, and we were representing uh, the HBCU community and we were considering how we might best partner uh, with the continent, uh, realizing that uh, there's exponential growth occurring uh, within the continent. We realized that uh, by 2050, that the uh, population will double by 2100, that one out of three persons in the world will be um, African uh, citizenry. And we realized that not only the numerical numbers as far as citizenry, but we realized the economic growth that is occurring now within the continent. And thank you for being the seminal um, um, seminal leader that's going to lead in, in the economic growth of the continent. And we look forward to partnering uh, as we are um, citizens of the diaspora, as we are um, cognizant of the, the, the fact that within the United States, uh, we have birth rates that are declining. So Secretary General, when I look for students to attend Clark Atlanta University and the other 100 um, colleges and universities that are HBCUs, we realize that we can't continue to just look to North America for our students. We realize that our students will come from the continent and we're excited about that. Uh, we're extremely excited. I have the opportunity of leading several organizations here in the United States, uh, which are quite impactful for HBCUs. So as we shared with uh, Dr. Gilpin this week, we have the opportunity to touch all of those institutions from what I uh, consider to be the flagship Howard University, uh, to the Atlanta University Center, which includes Spelman College, Morehouse College, Clark um, Atlanta University, and Morehouse School of Medicine, to, to the other, just say, 97 institutions, we're able to pick up the phone and we have those relationships so that whatever collaborations we need, we can have uh, with this organization. And we're just proud to be here. We're pleased to be here. We're super excited. And finally, Dr. Uh, Gilpin, not only did we visit um, Ethiopia recently, but we were in jo Johannesburg, South Africa, collaborating with, um, we, we actually met with the distinguished president of Howard University, uh, Dr. Frederick, as well as Ambassador Andrew Young. He visited with us there at the University of Johannesburg, and we have close relationships with them. 
with 55,000 students there. We're looking for them to trade um, and have interchanges of students as between Clark Atlanta University, University of Johannesburg, and other universities and colleges on the continent. So we're pleased to be here. Thank you, Dr. Gilpin. Uh, thank you so much, uh, President French, for those um, uh, opening remarks. And then I'd like to introduce um, my boss, um, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and um, Africa Director for UNDP, uh, Ms. Ahuna Isiakonwa, um, somebody who requires very little by way of introduction, but suffice to say, somebody whose passion and um, optimism for the continent is unbridled. Ahuna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Raymond, for getting us started. Your Excellency Wamkele Mene, uh, the Secretary General of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area uh, Secretariat. Dr. George French Jr., President of Clark Atlanta University. So good to see you again. And of course, uh, all uh, the others who have joined us, distinguished colleagues uh, joining us from across the African continent and across the world, but particularly here in the United States. A warm welcome to all of you. It is really with great pride and unbridled optimism that I welcome you to this historic event. We, uh, we see here that Africa's 55 economies have a unique opportunity to leverage their collective capacities and unleash a wave of economic transformation, innovative industrialization and sustained enhancement in the welfare of, uh, of the people because of this tremendous promise that we see in the Africa continental free trade area. In the coming months, years, and even decades, as Africa's population grows, so will the size and potential of its market. And this is why the world has to pay attention. As Africa re-engineers trade, the continent will find creative ways to retain the value of its output. As African countries invest in their people, as they invest in technology and as they invest in infrastructure, we will definitely see remarkable progress in the shared pros prosperity and societal resilience that will emerge. We're very pleased today to welcome His Excellency uh, Menet to this forum for his inaugural public lecture in the United States since his appointment, which is appropriately captioned how the African diaspora can seize opportunities provided by the one Africa market. And I really look forward to hearing his thoughts on this. Indeed, the task of sustainable and equitable economic transformation in Africa falls squarely to the people of African descent everywhere. It also requires fresh thinking and evidence-driven strategies. This is why we are proud to be partnering with the illustrious Clark Atlantic University and historically black colleges and universities in the United States uh, to host this event. And it is our hope that together we will be able to chart a new way forward and also to help African countries realize the benefits they could derive from the African continental free trade area arrangement. Today's event is the first in what I hope will be a series of transformative engagements that set the stage for concerted action that will redefine trade and investment across Africa. By doing so, we are all contributing to welfare, to well-being, and to human security of each of 
of all Africa's uh, 1.2 billion citizens. I want to thank you once again uh, for joining us today and really excited to hear the lecture. Back to you, Rema. Uh, thank you very much, um, Aruna, for, this, for, um, for those words. And, uh, to, and now I think it falls to me to um, introduce um, the uh, Secretary General of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat, His Excellency um, Wam Kellen Mene. Um, he's the first secretary. He's the first secretary general of the secretariat. Um, prior to joining the secretariat, he was head of mission, South African mission to the World Trade Organization. He is also um, chaired a number of um, international committees on trade and served as chief director um, for Africa Economic Relations in South Africa's Department of Trade and Industry. Um, he has um, degrees from a number of um, prestigious universities, including Rhodes University and the London School of Economics. It's um, with great pride that I do turn the, the uh, floor over to you, uh, Your Excellency Wam Kelemene, for your inaugural lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Gilpin. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, uh, in uh, New York with uh, UNDP. I want to thank um, uh, Madam Director Ezia Konwa, uh, President uh, French Jr. Um, for uh, arranging this um, very interesting conversation that um, I hope will result in concrete outcomes uh, for, uh, for the diaspora um, in relation to the African continental free trade area. Let me start by noting that it is entirely appropriate and um, as a matter of uh, practice that we have this conversation because the, the African Union has six regions. Five uh, regions are in Africa and the sixth region of the African continent is the diaspora. Um, and so it is already envisaged in the architecture of the African Union that the diaspora is a part uh, of the system of the African Union, whether it is governance, uh, political discourse, economic development discourse, the diaspora is at the heart of um, the, the African Union and its programs uh, that are designed to benefit uh, both Africans in Africa and Africans uh, outside of uh, Africa. We now are at, um, uh, at a moment um, where Africa is on the cusp of something that is unprecedented, at least since the end of uh, colonialism uh, 60, 65 years ago. For the very first time in the history of the African continent, in the economic history of the African continent, we have an opportunity to significantly integrate our markets, push back the frontiers of poverty, create jobs for young Africans, and create opportunities uh, that will endure uh, this, uh, the next uh, generation. This integration that is taking place is actually something that was foreseen by the founding mothers and founding fathers of the Organization of African Unity. It is a vision of an integrated Africa. Uh, a political uh, integration was started over 60 years ago. And we, we have made significant strides and successes in the political integration project um, on the African continent. But of course, uh, there was unfinished business. And the unfinished business is market economic integration and job creation. And so standing on the shoulders of the great liberation struggle heroes of, of, um, of our continent, Kwame Nkrumah, Patrice Lumumba, Augustino Neto, and Julius uh, Mwali Munyerere, and many other uh, liberation struggle heroes of our continent who uh, sacrificed uh, so that uh, this continent can be on a sustainable path to integration 
we now stand on their shoulders and we owe it to them to take forward that project and that vision of a political integration to an economic integration, a market integration, so that Africa is uh, uh, able to speak with one voice in global economic governance and is able to speak with one voice in creating uh, and enhancing her own global uh, competitiveness. So this is why this uh, um, project is so important. It is not just something that we started six, seven years ago uh, in terms of the AFCFTA negotiations. It is a vision that started um, many, many uh, decades ago. We now have um, a, uh, an African continental free trade area that has been ratified by 36 countries and uh, signed by 54 countries. Only one African country has not uh, signed uh, this agreement and about 19 uh, countries are in the process of ratifying uh, this agreement. That means that the, the, the political will is there, the legal commitment is there to expedite Africa's uh, uh, integration economically and to, as I said earlier, to be able to push back the frontiers of poverty. What we seek from this agreement is primarily to industrialize the African continent. Africa, as you know, continues. We continue 60, 70 years down the line to be trapped um, in, a, in a colonial economic model. We continue to export primary commodities to the rest of the world. We have very little value addition on the African continent with an exception of a few countries. We have very little, uh, uh, very shallow productive capacity, manufacturing capacity. Uh, our industrial development uh, um, has a great deal of room to improve our industrial development uh, capacity. We have uh, market fragmentation. We have smallness of national economies. We have lack of economies of scale. And as I say, uh, uh, more importantly and more worryingly uh, for me in particular, is the fact that we continue to be trapped in this uh, colonial economic model of uh, uh, exporting primary commodities, which is one of the biggest constraints to Africa's industrialization. And so through this agreement, we want to take concrete action, concrete steps uh, that will ensure that Africa does industrialize um, in, a, in a two or three decades time, that through this integrated market of 1.2 billion people, a market of a combined GDP of uh, 3.4 United States trillion dollars, uh, a market which actually, when you think about it, is as big a market as that of India and China. And so the potential for the African continent is quite significant. But as we discussed yesterday with Madam Director as Yakonwa, we have to move beyond being the continent with potential. We have to move beyond being the continent of the future. We have to be uh, the continent of today and unleash Africa's potential today. That is why we have this African continental free trade area because our heads of states realized that there is not a single country on the African continent, there's not a single region in Africa that can trade itself out of poverty. There's no region that is large enough that can trade itself into prosperity. We have to overcome the fragmentation of our markets and we have to make sure that we mobilize our combined resources um, targeted at Africa's industrial development. And there are a number of areas that um, uh, are, are, are areas that of, which can be of immediate interest and immediate results. Agro-processing, um, industrial development is, is uh, significantly improved by agro-processing. We don't want to just be in the primary 
uh, agricultural sector. We want our agricultural sector to advance in the value chain so that there's connectivity of the agro-processing sector with automobiles um, and other areas of um, uh, a, modern, a modern economy. Even if you look at an area such as uh, pharmaceuticals, which today has become, has come to the fore because of uh, the pandemic. We as Africans uh, have to ask ourselves, is it sustainable that in the year 2019, we imported $15 billion worth of pharmaceutical products? Um, our manufacturing capacity for, ma for pharmaceuticals uh, is very, very low. And so we have a unique opportunity through this agreement Uh, to introduce legal instruments for sales as a generic drug industry, a generic drug industry that will overcome some of these challenges that uh, we are facing today, such as the, the lack of access to uh, vaccines. And so it's very important that as a part of Africa's industrialization, we look at how our industrial development efforts can also be at the service of, of Africa's public health uh, initiatives. And so I mentioned these areas of uh, advancing Africa's industrial development because they offer opportunities for investment. This is where the diaspora becomes a very, very important part of um, our objective of industrializing the African continent. Um, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning, the diaspora is already recognized, legally recognized as the sixth region of the African continent. And so we should take uh, concrete action to include the diaspora in Africa's economic development. We don't want uh, to go uh, begging for investment from uh, 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 other parts of the world. We want the, uh, the, the, the diaspora which already has access to global capital markets, which already has access to investment capital, which already has access uh, and is, is, there are some leading uh, uh, um, private equity ventures that are owned by, by people in the diaspora. And so we want to encourage and invite the diaspora to critically think about how these, these, uh, uh, um, this access to global capital markets, how these investment resources, how they can be channeled towards productive sector investment on the African continent. Let's take another concrete example. Uh, there are cotton producing countries in West Africa, uh, uh, Benin, Burkina Faso, and so on. The investment that is required for capital machinery, capital goods in the area, in the sector of uh, cotton and the processing of cotton um, is huge. And so there is scope already for, for the, the diaspora to invest in, in cotton, in textiles and clothing, so that we, we as a continent can become not only regionally competitive, but globally uh, competitive uh, in the areas of textiles and clothing. In financial services, there are countries on the African continent who through this AFCFTA are liberalizing um, their financial services markets. They are liberalizing their services markets in general. There again, there is opportunity to invest in financial technology. There is opportunity to invest in, um, uh, in, uh, uh, um, in banks on the African continent that will be able to, uh, uh, to lend to small medium enterprises so that the, the, the market, the export market that we have opened, that we have created can actually be taken advantage uh, of. So there are a range of different, uh, a range of, of, of different investment opportunities that, um, the, the, that the diaspora can channel their investment uh, towards. And we stand ready to have that concrete conversation about how we can achieve this. We stand ready 
to partner with um, with the diaspora uh, to 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 identify um, the key areas of potential investment, and I want to emphasize productive sector investment uh, for job creation on the African continent. Fortunately, some of um, uh, already on the African continent, we do see successes. We see successes, for example, in mobile banking technology. We see successes um, in, in other financial uh, uh, products and innovation, digital financial innovation uh, that we have already identified in places like Kenya. We know that uh, in Senegal, there is already a success story for um, a pharmaceuticals industry that is beginning to emerge, uh, that was pushed to the fore by, by, uh, by COVID-19. So we do know, as a matter of fact, we do know that there are opportunities for productive sector investment on the African continent. And finally, um, we will establish a, um, an academy to train young trade professionals uh, in trade negotiations, in trade policy, uh, and in, in, uh, in trade negotiations. We have to build our own capacity as Africans, our own capacity for, uh, in the area of, um, of economic development so that we stop relying on others uh, to give us expertise and to, uh, uh, to give us uh, 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 knowledge that uh, uh, um, will help us to navigate the, glo the global economy. So we are going to train young trade professionals within the Secretariat. Here again is an opportunity for the diaspora uh, to contribute through skills, uh, to contribute through exchanging know-how um, in economic development. It is an opportunity that once again, I will um, invite the diaspora to strongly, to strongly consider. The diaspora has an ambassador uh, uh, to the African Union, uh, Ambassador Bennett, and I have met with her on two occasions, and we exchange views on how we can take concrete steps to include the diaspora in the implementation of the AFCFTA. This is a unique opportunity. It's unique in the sense that for the first time on the African continent, we have a single set of rules, a single rule book, for trade and investment uh, and how we, we uh, conduct and manage our trade relations in, in intra-Africa trade relations. And this provides a platform. This provides an opportunity for the, uh, uh, the diaspora to engage with us in a very, very commercially meaningful way and in a way that uh, will place emphasis on productive sector opportunities. We no longer as Africans want to be, as somebody said in a webinar that I was in last week, we don't want any more Africa, as this person said, to be the headquarters of poverty of the world. As you mentioned uh, earlier in your introductory remarks, in 2019, before the onset of uh, uh, COVID-19, of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world, six were in the African continent. Before COVID-19, we had some of the most dynamic and fast growing uh, economies in the world, second only to, to Southeast Asia. Uh, on average, the African continent uh, uh, was growing at about 3.5%, uh, which is, is nowhere near what we would like to see in order to push back the frontiers of poverty and to create job opportunities for young Africans. But it was a moderate growth figure and I hope that um, uh, as, as, we, as we recover um, in the post-COVID-19 era, that through aggressive implementation of the AFCFTA and that boosting intra-Africa trade becomes the driver of Africa's economic recovery and that this economic recovery on the back of trade on the African continent is going to create investment opportunities uh, for, for the diaspora. That is how I believe the central question today can be answered. It is by, by creating opportunities for productive sector investment 
industrial development investment, that's where we're going to be able to make a significant difference to Africa's economic uh, development. Let me conclude, if I may, by, by sharing this observation with you. The World Bank uh, last year um, uh, projected that um, where we implement this agreement effectively, by the year 2035, we will lift 100 million Africans out of poverty. 30 million Africans out of extreme poverty, 70 million Africans out of moderate, moderate poverty that we will lift um, out of poverty. I don't think that that is an impossible uh, projection to meet. I don't think that um, it, is, it is a dream. I think it can be a reality. We know this from other parts of the world. We know the impact of a development oriented oriented trade arrangement, we know its potential impact on uh, improving lives of, um, of citizens. We know that in less than a generation, China lifted almost 600 million people out of poverty, primarily, primarily through trade. Um, if you look at the experience also of other countries in Southeast Asia, um, the facts are very compelling that it is possible uh, that by the year 2035, 100 million Africans will be lifted out of poverty and that these, um, uh, um, uh, the beneficiaries will be primarily women who are, uh, who are in, um, in the informal sector, who are in trade, who are the drivers of um, Africa's informal sector. And so I think this contribution of uh, the diaspora will help Africa to achieve uh, this lifting of 100 million Africans out of poverty, will help Africa to achieve the SDGs as we set them out in Agenda 2030. Uh, it is an absolutely critical area of, uh, 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 that I would invite the, the diaspora to consider active participation in the implementation of, of this agreement. We already, in addition to the examples that I have mentioned, we are in the process of launching a $1 billion um, small medium enterprise facility, trade finance facility, which will benefit primarily women in, in trade finance. And there will be a, a commercial component to it. You will be able to invest and over time, you can recoup your investment. These are the types of concrete steps that we can take to give meaning uh, to, to the diaspora being the, 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 the sixth region of the African continent. So I want to thank you very much, uh, Madam Director and Madam President for organizing uh, this engagement today. I, I hope it is a, the first of many engagements to come. Um, this conversation is very, very timely. It happens when, when Africa is on the cusp of something that is truly potentially transformative. I thank you very much. Um, thank you. Th thank you very much, um, uh, the Excellency Imam Kelemeni. Um, for that, um, I think, very um, forward-leaning um, uh, public lecture. Um, you started by um, identifying the diaspora as the sixth region in the African Union. I'm sure many people listening did not know that. Um, and this is what validates our engagement um, with the um, diaspora, people of African descent everywhere. You also um, said something that's really resonated, um, moving away from making Africa the continent of potential to the continent of today. We really need to take steps to address a lot of the things to make a difference today if, we're, if, we, if, if the AFCFTA is going to be meaningful. You then outlined a number of ways in which the diaspora could support um, the um, AFCFTA through investment, financial streams, through engagement, through supporting and being part of industrialization and through capacity building and skills transfer, through education and training, and also through job creation. 
I think these are all powerful ways in which um, we could think about the one Africa, not just about one Africa on the continent, but one Africa integrating people of African descent everywhere. And this is why today's conversation is particularly important. We now have about half an hour um, to have questions and uh, an engagement with um, the Secretary General. If you have questions, please post them in the Q&A. We'll be looking at the Q&A box. I've seen a few there already. Um, but before I call on the first speaker, I was, and I know that our regional director has another engagement. Um, I may not be here till the end. I wonder if she has any just um, brief thoughts to share. No, uh, Raymond, I will listen in for a little while. Uh, just really interested to hear uh, the reflections of uh, 120 participants uh, to what I think it's really uh, an inspiring uh, lecture by, by His Excellency, the Secretary General. So I will uh, give yield the floor to reactions from the audience. So. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Regional Director. Uh, let me start by calling on um, Dr. William Spriggs. He's a professor of economics and former chair of the Department of Economics at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Um, Dr. Spriggs, could, you, could we unmute Dr. Spriggs and have him ask his question, please? Dr. Spriggs, I think you're unmuted. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and thank you for uh, this very encouraging talk. It would be a great way to take advantage of recent e-migration from Africa so that the talent that's here can contribute. And of course, for those of us who have left the continent centuries ago to continue to make contributions it's an exciting concept. I just wanna make sure that we understand what the actual standing of the diaspora will be. Is this to simply encourage our participation or is the treaty going to actually give us standing so that African diaspora owned corporations are treated as actually part of the continent and therefore have free access to the market. And whether as you were talking about funding for uh, as small minority uh, businesses uh, and medium-sized uh, enterprises, SMEs, wh whether that funding is extended specifically to those of the diaspora uh, to, to participate in the area. The idea of us all finally coming together is exciting and encouraging. Um, but as they always say, uh, the devils are in the details and having an easy access would be key to understanding how we can generate the excitement, the expertise um, and the experience and the access to capital that those of us in the diaspora have, have been building um, up, up to this point. Uh, thank you very much, um, Professor Spriggs, for that question on what's the standing and the access of the diaspora um, Secretary General? Well, thank you, uh, Dr. S uh, uh, Spriggs, for, for that question. Um, I listened very, very carefully to, to the, the underlying point, or at least as I understood the underlying point uh, being made. The type of uh, investment that we uh, would like to encourage is investment in Africa, uh, on the continent that creates jobs and that uh, uh, creates opportunities for young, for young people on the African continent. If you are a corporation, um, a manufacturing corporation or any type of, of entity 
um, we encourage you to establish a commercial presence on the African continent. By so doing, you will actually have access to the 1.2 billion uh, people market um, that we, we were talking about earlier. Uh, so it's an opportunity to expand your market, to expand into a, um, a completely new, new market um, that is, is uh, uh, in our view, very, very fast growing and, and dynamic. Uh, so so the, the rules of origin that are embedded in the agreement will enable you to establish a presence, a commercial presence on the African continent, and you will have access through all the countries that are state parties uh, to, to the agreement. The, the funding that we are talking about is a form of a credit. Um, the support to small medium enterprises will be a form of a credit. Um, and the commercial entities that we are, the banks that we are in conversation with to establish and to mobilize uh, uh, these resources, this trade finance facility, they have to overcome a range of uh, uh, um, uh, difficulties such as insurance mitigation, which already in, in Africa is already a problem cross border. Uh, one of the challenges that we're trying to overcome at the moment is if you have a, a facility, a fund that is, uh, whose eligibility will be across the African continent, um, how do you as a commercial bank, how do you mitigate the risk across borders um, because insurance, uh, insurers tend to be uh, focused on a particular jurisdiction. So these are, I think that that challenge will, will extend over to the diaspora if there is to be a decision that, that uh, the access, the, that the diaspora should also be eligible for, um, uh, uh, for support under the, um, the facility. But I think what's important to bear in mind is that we want the facility to support and to boost intra-Africa trade. And you don't have to be, um, uh, uh, you, you, the, the intra-Africa trade can be boosted by a diaspora in Africa. Uh, you don't have to yourself be physically in Africa, but you can set up um, a commercial presence uh, that will boost intra-Africa trade. So that's the purpose of, um, of the facility so that in a few years time, we are able to move beyond the 18% intra-Africa trade uh, where we are at the moment. We are not naive and emotional uh, uh, to think that, um, or to expect that the diaspora should just come and give money. We expect that um, uh, where the diaspora invests that you will see a return on your investment. Um, so, so that's that. I think is an important aspect uh, to bear in mind. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, next, um, we'll now take a question from Dr. Joanne Rowe from Medgar Evers College in New York. She's a dean of the School of Business. Dr. Rowe, you have the floor. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Oh, wonderful. It was an exciting and interesting uh, lecture. I mean, what a, a, a wonderful aspiration to lift Africa out of poverty. And it was Nelson Mandela that said, it's impossible until someone does it. And you rightfully so that China came in and did it. So it is indeed possible. I bring you greetings from Mega Everest College and our interim president, Denise Maybeck, our provost, Provost Augustine Okariki and the Mech College family. Thanks again to the entire team who collaborated on this timely event, and a special thanks to Dr. Farad Mohammed and the OHBCU uh, National Working Group who've been working behind the scenes uh, with the uh, UNDP team for several years now. In reference to this specific presentation, how will we proceed within the context of the new Biden administration here in the U.S., where there is lots of opportunity for investment? Uh, 
the, the Biden administration has been slow to talk about trade for several reasons. And one of them is that he's still getting his cabinet set up and he wants to have the executives in place. The second reason is he wants to consult with allies so that possibly you can have better relationships than we had in previous administrations. He's looking at some of the previous trade ag agreements like the TPP, and he has some concerns about the environment and labor. And then he, and then this is what I believe is the reason why he he's slowest is because he pri he's prioritizing the uh, uh, broader economic plan before he does the trade plan. And I say all that to say, uh, uh, you know, in the context uh, of that, will um, a trade between the U.S. and the diaspora be slower because of this? I mean, we know that he recently announced or the Senate recently uh, 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 confirmed Catherine Tai, but the very first uh, public interview she had, which was on the 28th, she cited that her focus was on China and the related U.S. tariffs. So, in the and and we haven't had a U.S. African trade agreement. Um, Kenya, they're they're currently working on the Kenya U.S. trade agreement, uh, and that again is slow. So, in the absence of a U.S. trade agreement, I'm getting to my question: How would you advise African American diaspora business? to proceed or indeed accelerate with this exciting new opportunity that you've presented to us today. Thank you very much, Dean Rowe. Your Excellency, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Gilpin. And I want to thank Dr. Rowe for, for the question. Um, certainly, I, I, I appreciate the, um, the fact that uh, you know, there is a substantive change. Um, there's a change in diplomacy. There's a change in tone uh, with the, the, the Biden, the Biden-Harris administration. We are no longer referred to in a pejorative sense uh, anymore by somebody sitting in, um, in the White House. And so that really is, is, um, is a good start. Um, second, I would note that it is the Biden administration, the Biden-Harris administration that strongly supported um, Madam Ngozi for the position to be the first African and the first woman director general of uh, the WTO. The previous administration had blocked um, her appointment. Um, it was the only country in the world, the US at that time, was the only country in the world that blocked um, her appointment. When the Biden-Harris administration uh, took over, the, the, um, the U.S. Uh, reversed that unfortunate position and strongly supported uh, Madam Ngozi. And I know that um, the, the, the vice president uh, um, 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 uh, uh, of the United States did have a call with the director general a few weeks ago and uh, express the United States support for her as the first African and the first uh, woman director general of the WTO. And so I think it, 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 we appreciate very much the change in tone, the civil tone, the positive tone and the constructive tone of engagement. Where this will take us in, term, in concrete terms about uh, the future of trade relations between Africa and the United States, it is still unclear. We know that in 2025, uh, AGOA will expire. Um, and so countries in Africa will have to think about, um, a, um, which I'm sure this is something the incoming USTR will also have to think about, is how do we, um, what do we do about post-AGOA trade relations uh, between the United States and, um, and Africa. There are negotiations, as you correctly uh, mentioned, Dr. Roll, there are negotiations that are ongoing uh, between Kenya and, um, and the United States uh, uh, that are, I, and I don't know uh, the level of detail for that uh, negotiation to be able to express a view on it. What I would say is this, um, the African continent will have to engage with the United States at the right time about a post-AGOA uh, trade arrangement. 
what it will be its form i i it's difficult to 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 predict that now that is something that uh, in the next year or two years will become much much clearer um what we are offering through the african continental free trade area is that actually you can invest directly um, uh, um, through the AFCFTA, through the African Continental Free Trade Area, you can invest directly in this uh, market of 1.2 uh, billion people, which is projected by the year 2035 to be a combined uh, GDP uh, of almost 8 trillion US dollars. And so the even without a formal uh, a reciprocal trade arrangement between the African continent and um, uh, uh, the United States, I believe that this agreement offers an opportunity uh, for investment directly. And I mentioned some of the concrete areas uh, in which uh, that investment, through which that investment can be channeled. Um, we later is the, the diaspora ambassador. We discussed the possibility of when uh, the COVID situation has subsided, bringing together um, the diaspora and the AFCFTA um, to talk about deal making in the context of the AFCFTA. Not, not speeches, but how can we make trade and investment deals, a trade and investment forum between the AFCFTA and the diaspora. Uh, at the right time, we will be able to make the announcement about the dates for that. But certainly, that is something that I would like us to focus on um, before the year is over. Of course, the, the COVID situation uh, permitting. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, um, Secretary General. We have almost 20 questions for you in the Q&A chat box. We're not going to have time to get to all of those. Uh, but let me just summarize three of those from the question and answer chat box um, um, for your consideration. Uh, but before I do, we've also had a number of people asking whether or not this um, um, event will be recorded because they'd like to listen to your remarks again. Yes, it will be recorded and be posted on the UNDP Africa um, website. Um, Secretary General, Kobina Hughes asked a question that speaks to the philosophy of AFCFTA. What's the economic philosophy? Because Kobina fears that it will focus on big business and leave the poor behind, creating a gap between the haves and the have-nots that's deeper than it currently exists. Um, Yu, Yu Jiang also harps on this. He says that he hears you, or he or she, say that he hears you on manufacturing as a driver for economic development. What's the economic model? How would it work and how will it deliver not just um, higher productivity, but welfare and sustainability for all? And then thirdly, um, Shakira Abdul Ali, I uh, wants to know where the single currency fits in all of this. Good. So thank you very much again uh, for the comments and, um, and the questions. Um, myself and, um, and Dr. Kategebwa, we negotiated at the WTO. We spent a lot of time at the WTO. And one of the things that we learned is that if you drive trade liberalization um, without a development component, those um, uh, uh, inequalities that already exist amongst countries and within countries, those inequalities uh, become pronounced. Um, trade liberalization um, and breaking down barriers to trade, in my view, is not in and of itself an end and should not be. And so if we negotiate a trade agreement that uh, accentuates the divide between the rich and the poor, between developed and developing countries, there will be a backlash. Um, 
and people will, Africans will reject this agreement and correctly so in my view. Um, and that is why we have a very important partnership with UNDP because um, we have learned from the mistakes of past trade agreements that leave behind very, very important segments of society. And that's why um, in many, many countries in Europe, um, there was a backlash against globalization. There was a backlash against trade agreements because the perception was that globalization and trade agreements have benefited only the elite, only the big multinational corporations. And as we recently heard about three or four years ago in this country, that um, trade agreements exported jobs, American jobs uh, to Mexico. So if we don't take steps to address um, this question of backlash against free trade agreements and uh, globalization, we will be doing a disservice to the African continental free trade area. That is why we're taking the following concrete steps. We, have, we are establishing a trade finance facility, which will be exclusively for um, small medium enterprises that are led um, by women uh, primarily. Those will be the, the, uh, the primary beneficiaries, will be uh, women in, um, in trade on the African continent. We similarly are, are introducing platforms to reach young people directly so that we have an ongoing conversation uh, um, with young Africans about how this agreement can be of service to them. Trade agreements are not about the past. Trade agreements are about um, the future. And we are also uh, very much aware that um, if, we, if, we, if we leave behind countries on the African continent that are today less industrialized, that are today uh, uh, less endowed in terms of manufacturing capacity, there again, we will be creating a divide within Africa, uh, which uh, in, in many cases is already there. So we have to take uh, concrete steps to, to close that divide uh, uh, between countries on the African continent who are industrialized relatively and those that today are not relatively industrialized. Let me give you an example. It is possible to establish value chains um, and industrial development capacities across a region with a country specific um, operation or value chain that it is focusing on. 20 years ago, Lesotho, a small country surrounded by South Africa, um, engaged on the value chain of textiles and clothing. And at that time, Lesotho had no industrial capacity. 20, 21 years later, Lesotho is one of the leading exporters of textiles and clothing. Um, supplies Gap is part of the value chain of automobiles that are being exported from South Africa to Europe. Um, and so you can see from and creating over 200,000 jobs, um, formal decent jobs, you can already see from this example of Lesotho um, that it is possible that even amongst countries um, where they are less industrialized countries uh, and those that are already industrialized, it is possible in 20 to 25 years, it is possible to, to make a change. So the, the economic model that we, we are uh, looking at is, is the one that I've just tried to articulate. Uh, let me also say that we are not in a position to replace um, uh, um, macroeconomic thinking at national level and how countries are going to um, individually approach challenges around economic development and disparities. That will remain the, the exclusive jurisdiction of the countries themselves. What we want to make sure is that the, the trade arrangement is complementary to um, the, the, the solutions that countries are seeking to find to uh, uh, challenges of, um, of economic uh, uh, disparities. So that's, that's the model. Um, we want to have a trade agreement that supports industrialization in Africa, that supports national level economic development objectives, 
through trade and through boosting um, intra-Africa trade. The, the single currency. Um, one of the objectives under the African Union is that at some point, at some point in future, and this will be a long time, that Africa should be a monetary union uh, and have a single currency. Of course, that comes with, uh, um, uh, that is attendant with an array of uh, um, uh, um, very technical things like macroeconomic convergence, uh, macroeconomic policy convergence, uh, convergence criteria, and so on. Uh, so I think that is a long-term uh, project. In the short term, what we have been doing to overcome this uh, uh, barrier of uh, 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 multiple currencies on the African continent, in fact, it's not multiple, it's a multiplicity. We have 42 countries on the uh, uh, currencies on the African continent, which in and of itself is a constraint to intra-Africa trade and to boosting intra-Africa trade. And we've recognized uh, uh, this constraint. That is why we took the first step of um, introducing a payments and settlement, uh, a pan-African payments and settlement platform. So you will now be able to, uh, when this uh, uh, platform is rolled out by the middle of the year, you will be able to, uh, you are in Ghana, in Accra, your counterparty is in Nairobi, Kenya, you are trading under the AFCFTA, you will now be able to transact through the platform, this digital platform, in your own currency, in Ghanaian CD. The recipient will then receive uh, Kenyan shillings without having to go through the hassle of uh, currency convertibility through the dollar or the euro. That will all be centralized in a digital platform. It is not going to solve the problem of not having a single currency, but it is a start towards uh, solving that problem in in the future. Uh, so we will be taking those those steps um, as we go along. It is incredibly difficult, and we know this from the experience of Europe, very, very difficult to have macroeconomic convergence and a convergence criteria of 55 different countries. Um, it is something that, that will take a very, very long time. Uh, but it is in in the vision of an integrate. It is within the vision of an integrated Africa. I have water, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, less than ten minutes left. Um, let me invite um, Dr. Charles Richardson Jr., Dean of the Business School from Misericordia University in Pennsylvania. Can you hear me okay? We can hear yes, you, Dr. Richard. Great. Thank you so much. Greetings to all my colleagues uh, across the world throughout the diaspora, particularly with my colleagues at CAU, uh, Dr. French, uh, Dr. Gibbs, and Dr. Bazuna. My question revolves around the idea of SDGs. Uh, we're about one third of the 15 year journey to its 2030 implementation. And particularly for the audience of HBCUs, MSIs, and educational institutions across the diaspora, my question relates to how do we communicate the relevance of the SDG platform to the mission of the MSI institutions? Secondly, how do we balance the messaging between the appropriateness of a comprehensive perspective with the possibility of the message presenting the issues as an overwhelming task and a potential disincentive to action? And thirdly, how do we bridge the gap between the argument of social justice and environmental justice, which as you know, the SDGs uh, compile together in one movement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Richardson. In the interest of time, let me invite um, Dr. Mespin Bezune from Clark Atlanta University also to ask his question. So the section general could um, have both together because we are running out of time. Dr. Mespin. Okay, while we um, sort it out technically to get um, 
Thank you, General. Please go ahead. I think um, Dr. Richardson had uh, three very excellent questions for you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I lost connection uh, through through uh, uh, Dr. J uh, Richardson's uh, questions. I I may have gotten uh, one or or two of them. Um, the question around social justice and vis-a-vis uh, -vis environmental justice, I actually, um, uh, I am one, or I share the view that, uh, that there is no contradiction uh, on matters of social justice vis-a-vis -vis environmental justice. Um, and I will, I will cite um, an, an example. Uh, we know that in, in um, in countries uh, on the African continent that are uh, industrializing, uh, who aspire to industrialize, um, we know that this issue of um, environmental uh, justice, environmental awareness, that it does come up when communities have to be relocated um, uh, in order to, uh, to build infrastructure, for example, um, uh, is is something that uh, that that happens uh, uh, quite quite often, uh, but we have we have models where it has worked uh, on at least on the African continent. I don't know about other parts of the world. We have models where where uh, communities, um, uh, the the social rights of communities, governments are required to uphold them. Uh, governments are required if they want to adhere to environmental justice, environmental uh, 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 standards. Um, the, the government is required to provide compensation uh, to communities if communities have to be relocated uh, to, uh, to make room for, um, for infrastructure development. Uh, so we also know that even in, in the area of intellectual property rights, um, that uh, there have been instances where um, uh, communities' environment, environmental assets of communities uh, were exploited without compensation to those uh, uh, communities. So the society as a whole um, uh, has traditional knowledge. The society as a whole has um, uh, 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 genetic resources. Uh, that are assets and that are that can be exploited uh, for market, uh, and there are instances where um, uh, the the those communities are not compensated for their uh, for their environmental assets, and so uh, we have to uh, continue pushing this model of fairness and equity between the rights of the communities, the rights of the society on the one hand and um, environmental concerns on the other hand, or environmental uh, uh, justice uh, on the other hand. Uh, it is related to the point that I, I made earlier, and that is that um, I don't believe that um, a, 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 an aspiration for uh, Africa's industrial development necessarily negates, for example, public health, or negates infrastructure uh, uh, development objectives. I think it is possible to find a model uh, that reconciles uh, what appears on the face of it to be to be a tension um, or, uh, or, or or indeed a, uh, a contradiction. Um, I, I I did not get the first question that uh, uh, Dr. Richardson uh, asked. If you could. Please uh, uh, repeat it if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Gilpin. Uh, Dr. Dr. Richardson, if you could very quickly um, just um, re repeat the first question. And after that, um, I'll ask Dr. Mespin to briefly ask his question. So if we could unmute Dr. Mespin to go after Dr. Richardson. Dr. Richardson, you have the floor. Yes, very quickly. The first part of the question was how do we communicate the relevance of the SDG platform to the mission of the MSI institutions? I see. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mesfin? Yes, can you hear me now? Thank you. 
We can hear okay. you. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. When, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much. Uh, just to listen uh, to you about this uh, agreement is uh, really, as I say, uh, music to our ears. I am, I am a student of trade and development all my life, and uh, uh, it is wonderful to to hear this uh, development. But I want to, you have addressed them, but let me just bring them again to you. As, as you know, with this uh, <clears throat> trade and development, the benefits, there are gainer, gains and losers in each country. And uh, in Africa, as you know, we have about uh, five, six regional common markets and some have been successful to a limited time, some are not, and now they have been right uh, brought in under this uh, FTA. And that is, that's a good thing. And I just uh, wonder, uh, you have only uh, 35 uh, signatories out of 55 countries. I wonder if you can just highlight quickly, we don't have the time, what is some of the issues that some of these countries uh, at least highlight why they did not come to the forefront like the other 35, 36 country uh, joined the, the wagon. Is it is this is the losers and the gains issue, um, uh, and the other one, if you have the time, is that the concern is that in, in our part of the world in Africa, uh, losers and gainers uh, will be there, and how do we actually compensate for the losers? I think you mentioned a couple of them, such as establishing trade financing cooperation for women, but as you know. In the developing countries, there is so much, so many policies, price ceiling, price floor, price subsidies, uh, and, and a number of safety nets to compensate the losers from trade, from globalization, from free trade. And I just wonder okay. uh, uh, for you. Uh, okay. I think. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Mestrin. Um, over to you. Secretary General. Thank you very much again for the um, for the questions. <clears throat> uh, yes, in in um, in trade, there are winners uh, and they are they are losers. Uh, the question that we have sought to address is um, how do we, in the long term, how do we make sure that um, the losers benefit? Um, uh, through this uh, uh, trade agreement. We've done the studies. We know that, in, that there will be countries that will be immediate beneficiaries. For example, um, we know that countries uh, in Africa, such as Morocco, uh, Egypt, Kenya, South Africa, countries that are relatively, relatively industrialized, that they will be the immediate beneficiaries of new markets. Uh, being opened in, uh, to them, uh, either because of their their relative uh, uh, manufacturing uh, capacity and industrial base, uh, but we don't want this to benefit only a handful of already industrialized African countries, uh, because if we if we if we allow that to happen, um, the agreement will be rejected by Africans. Uh, first and second, uh, it goes back to the point that was being made earlier, uh, that the, the income uh, disparities um, uh, will be pronounced even further amongst African countries. Um, and that is something that we have at all costs. We have to make sure that we avoid um, uh, further uh, uh, accentu accentuating the, the economic disparity within uh, African countries uh, and across African countries. So the example that I mentioned of Lesotho is instructive to me because it points to the, and there are others, by the way, in, in East Africa about how trade liberalization can actually um, uh, 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 make a contribution to a country's economic growth. Um, so we have to establish value chains that will be spread across the African continent. 
so that uh, we, we, we all see the benefits. Um, 20 years ago, 21 years ago, if you asked Lesotho whether or not they would be able to benefit from a trade agreement, they would have told you no. We have no capacity to benefit from a trade agreement and we don't, we're not interested. But now we know that the reality is different. Um, and so even what today, based on our studies, uh, countries that appear to be losers today, we have to uh, uh, um, roll out an industrial action plan that will, that will make them more competitive in one sector or the other. If you think about Singapore, for example, um, in the early 50s, 1951 up to 56, Singapore was a fishing village. Um, and yet Singapore over decade, decade after decade of implementing um, an industrial uh, action plan, they were able to diversify their economy. Uh, same thing with uh, Taiwan and, and so on. So um, yes, it is true that they will be losers today, but we have to look in the long term um, how we want to improve Africa's industrial uh, capacity. In the short term, what we are doing to address this question of losers is um, Africsim Bank, which is a, the African Export and Import Bank, has mobilized about uh, um, up to $7 billion that will be um, uh, uh, available for countries who are implementing the AFCFTA who um, uh, uh, are in that category of, of uh, uh, losers, or rather, to be precise, there are sectors within a country that may be losers. And so this adjustment facility will be for uh, directed to uh, countries who can identify that they are in the area of textiles and clothing as a result of the AFCFTA, they see revenue shortfall, um, revenue losses as a result of trade liberalization. That uh, adjustment facility is going to assist them to make the necessary investment interventions, whether it is capital goods, uh, machinery, uh, so that they they become more competitive, or if it is a grandfather industry that uh, uh, um, they are no longer competitive in, um, the facility will be available to retrain uh, workers and to have them deployed in in other parts of um, of the economy. In the short term, we believe that this adjustment facility um, will help in addressing this question of winners um, and, um, and losers. Why are some countries um, slow to ratify the agreement? Um, as you may know, ratification of an international agreement is um, an act of, uh, uh, in many countries, it is, it is done by the legislative branch of the government um, and and uh, legislative processes they they differ from country to country. Um, uh, uh, in my conversations with many heads of states, uh, they they are absolutely committed to ratifying uh, the agreement. Those who have not yet ratified it, uh, but of course they have to go through domestic legal processes, um, which take time depending on um, on where you are. Um, some of the concerns that have been expressed about why countries, are, are some countries, are slow to ratify. Uh, for example, I know that the issue of transshipment of goods is a big concern. Um, there are many countries who are worried about uh, um, importation of uh, a shirt, put a button on it and say made in the AFCFTA. And so this is something that uh, we are working to um, uh, address those concerns with, uh, with those countries. Uh, it is already uh, made provision for in the agreement, but uh, transshipment of, uh, of goods is a very big concern for, for, for many, many countries because it can create job losses. Uh, and we don't want this agreement to create job losses. We want it to, uh, to create jobs. But I am confident that by the middle of this year, we will have um, probably about 45 countries will have ratified the agreement establishing the AFCFTA. 
um, uh, which is a, uh, a very encouraging number uh, because for over a year, governments were focusing on fighting the pandemic and, and there was no uh, progress being made to, um, uh, in the area of ratification of the AFCFTA. Mr. Mr. Dr. Gilpin? Yes, Dr. Dr. Gilpin. Devon, I just have to compliment, I have to compliment you uh, for this uh, August discussion and and this, the, the, the Secretary General for being with us and uh, your passion for not just talk is so invigorating to the HBCU community and to the diaspora. And, and it's our hope that we can establish a task force and develop action items for actually partnering with your HBCUs. And these are your HBCUs because you are my brother and, and we're here. And we want to, um, we would hope that we could establish a task force as among HBCUs, AFCTA, uh, and actually sit down and talk about what the next steps would be. Uh, absolutely, uh, President French, and I, 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 I know you speak on behalf of um, all the um, HBCUs here, and even those who are not here. Um, uh, the Secretary General earlier on alluded to a number of ways that um, this community um, could support and be part of the AFCFTA, um, and I'm sure that a task force would help us um, deliver on, on, on those. But I think at this point, um, it does remain for me um, to thank you, um, uh, Secretary General Wam Kelly Mene, um, for being so generous with, with your time, for fielding so many questions on a broad range of um, topics. As you said in the beginning, um, we hope that this is not the end of the conclude of the conversation, but that we're going to have more discussions um, on these issues and to see how together we could find um, a pathway um, to sustain sustained uh, progress and success for people of African descent everywhere. Um, to uh, our co-hosts, um, uh, President French and Clark Atlanta University, thank you so much um, for um, doing this with us. To all the HBCUs here present, everybody who has asked a question, there's been tremendous interest, over a hundred comments in the chat box and um, 26 questions in the Q&A box. Um, we have people from three continents um, represented here. Um, so there is, there is a lot of interest and at, U, at, at UNDP, we stand um, ready to um, support this going forward and working with everyone to um, move, move ahead. But before I close, I'd like to thank everybody who, who uh, worked tirelessly to make this possible. Um, our tech team, our comms teams, thank you so much. I also want to thank in particular um, Dr. Joy Kategekwa, who's unfortunately had to go to another meeting, and Dr. Farid Mohammed from the OHBCUs. Thank you so much um, for being um, such a, a great partner. And so apologies for starting um, late in the beginning, but I think um, it ended up being worth it. Um, the recorded version of this um, session will be on the UNDP website and we'll share the link um, as soon as we can. And um, good, good day, good afternoon, good evening, and safe travels to everyone who uh, will be traveling. I know you'll be traveling back, um, Secretary General. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kilpin. Um, I want to thank everybody for the comments and the questions, the enthusiasm, um, I, I look forward to working with, um, with all of you. And certainly I, I want to thank also uh, uh, President uh, French uh, Junior, uh, UNDP for organizing this event. Um, I, I, I look forward to uh, the establishment of that task team. Certainly we can do that. Um, I, I have a soft spot for Atlanta because my in-laws live there. So it is, um, I have to give back to the community as it were. <laughs> so I look forward to, um, uh, to that engagement uh, uh, through the task team. So thank you very much. Thank you.
you said you look forward to coming back to Atlanta and speaking at Clark Atlanta University. Is that what I said? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. I am, Dr. French. Yeah. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.